So this is, um, this is actually a billboard uh, when Heineken 0.0 launched in London about two years ago. Um, and I thought it was really intriguing because um, the beer guys have learned just as we have in the wine space that uh, before you get to no alcohol, we're talking about great taste because in the beer space they've learned, as we have learned in wine, is that when somebody wants to moderate their alcohol, they want to give up what they enjoy about beer or wine. It's flavour. <laughs> so, are the beer guys serious about lower alcohol, low no alcohol? You bet your Heineken 0.0 they are. <laughs> now, Heineken, Carlsberg, and the big guy in the room, AB InBev, senior management at the top level have all come out and said that they believe that by 2025, 20% of their global beer sales, 20%, will be lower or no alcohol beer. So they're serious about it. So what about wine? One in three premium wine drinkers, and when I say premium wine drinkers, I'm talking about in Australia, somebody that's spending more than $15 a bottle. In the UK, more than six pounds. In Sweden, 90 kroner. In Canada, $15. One in three premium wine drinkers moderated their intake of alcohol in the last three months. We call these moderation occasions. Those occasions are increasing in frequency. And this is consistent across all the markets. We, we track New Zealand, Australia, the UK, Sweden, Canada, the US. There's two main groups, as this slide might suggest. The aging baby boomers, like me, trying to defy gravity and everything else heading south. And then on the left, the so-called millennials, and why are they important? Because they will supersede the group on the right in terms of their spending power in the next decade or so for many markets. So they're really important. So what's the role of lighter wine or lighter in alcohol wine? And the way we define that is less than 10% ABV and wines that are overtly marketed as lighter in alcohol. And typically in our program, wines are being marketed as 25 to 30 percent lighter in alcohol compared to a, um, a, a comparable wine, so a full strength wine equivalent. Now I've stolen uh, this um, slide really from Peter Drucker, is anybody familiar with him? I have mentioned it to a few younger members of, um, of this conference and uh, they kind of looked at me blankly, but um, I'm a fan of Peter Drucker, he's one of the preeminent management thinkers of the 20th century and if anybody wants to get a great book, it's called The Management Challenges of the 21st Century, which he wrote before he died in the late 90s, and what he was talking about then is actually happening now. So Peter Drucker, he divided products up into two very simple classes, today's breadwinners and tomorrow's breadwinners. So today's breadwinners, the innovations of yesterday, so one could argue is that New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc falls into that category. So today's breadwinners, very important, they keep us afloat today. Tomorrow's breadwinners are either completely new products or uh, modified or, or improved um, uh, today's breadwinners. So what we've been talking about the last couple of days in terms of taking Sauvignon Blanc to the next level, modifications, improvements, and lighter in alcohol we consider to be uh, not the breadwinner of tomorrow, but a breadwinner. And why is it important to have breadwinners of tomorrow? Because like it or not, uh, eventually, today's breadwinners become yesterday's breadwinners. So is there a demand for lighter wine, lower alcohol wine? Lower alcohol wine? Uh, well, you don't have to bet on it, we know there is. Um, we've been tracking this market since uh, 2014, and based on our latest survey, 45% of premium wine drinkers were likely to purchase a lighter in alcohol wine, providing it had comparable flavour to their normal wine of choice. This category is driven by what we call moderation occasions. Um, but when somebody has an occasion like that, they don't want to give up what they actually enjoy about wine, which is, which is great flavour. And the interesting thing, um, particularly for this audience, uh, given that we're all here uh, to talk about Sauvignon Blanc, is that Sauvignon Blanc drinkers are more likely than the average premium wine drinker 
to purchase lighter and alcohol. And we've certainly seen this in this market, and I'll share with you some numbers a little bit later on. So we know the market opportunity is real, and I actually quite like this slide. I don't know if you recognise it, that's the space shuttle, and off to the right of its, its right wing is, is Marlborough. And uh, this space shuttle was called the Endeavour, and about 250 years before that, Captain Cook and his ship, the Endeavour, was in sailing by in the waters. So I can show you how fast things change. Uh, we launched the first low alcohol wine here in New Zealand in the late 80s, and it failed! And that's because timing is everything. We're a few decades ahead uh, of, of when the timing is right, and the timing is right now because we know the demand is there. But at the beginning of this initiative, the question we ask is, can we actually make wines, in particular premium wines, um, that consumers not only want to buy once, they want to keep buying, because repeat purchasing, that's what it's about. So we had to um, really think about things in a different way. So I'll hand over. You can push the buttons if you want. Yep. Oh, I'm here. I'm oh, all good. You good? Okay. Thank you, Richard, for that introduction. So there is a real market there. The, the challenge for us is actually making the wines to match the demands of our consumers, which we're well conditioned with the wines that preceded this initiative. And many of you who are guests in New Zealand, I hope you've discovered that Kiwis tend to look at the world quite differently. And I think this image sort of depicts it pretty well. We have New Zealand on the top of the world, not the bottom of the world. Uh, and because of our, pro our proxi proximity, or is that distance from everywhere else, we've had a culture of actually having to survive and uh, innovate in isolation. And that's bred a breed of innovators within our industry, and we tend to have to look at things differently. But when it came to the challenge of making lighter wines, it was actually our first go-to was actually, can we buy or obtain the technology to enable us to make lighter or lower in alcohol wines by taking knowledge or technology or approaches off the shelf? We don't know of anywhere in the world a wine industry or a region within the world that is focused on the production of lower in alcohol wine as an initiative. So we had to go and build from the ground up the technology and the knowledge to enable our industry to produce wines that met the demands of our consumers. Next slide. And this came about an initiative, a group of 18 wineries that basically got together in 2013 with the support both financial and encouragement from New Zealand wine growers. And that combined uh, funding and resource and a real sense of collaboration, which I'm sure is not lost on our guests to this occasion. This industry has the best collaboration of any wine industry I know. So the sharing of information is very real and the opportunity to capture the combined capability to enable us to meet this challenge and tackle this challenge came out of these 18 wineries seizing this opportunity and coming together. With that combined resource, we were able to apply for funding and we've been supported by the Ministry of Primary Industries through one of their research funds. So combined, we launched in 2014 a multifaceted research project. Uh, just a, a couple of elements. This is the largest research initiative for our industry. So it's not just something ticking, in, uh, I use the term ticking in the background, it's not minor in its ticking, this is a major effort on behalf of our industry. It's a seven year program, we're five years into it and making some real progress. So the focus is to, to produce lighter and alcohol wines produced naturally, so not through the assistance or the use of reverse osmosis or spinning cone or other mechanical means. So the goal is to produce the wines naturally and to be still expressive and uh, providing all that enjoyment and joy that you get out of the existing full-strength wines. And Jeff Thorpe introduced yesterday the BHAG, or Big Harry Audacious Goal. We had one of those too, and that was to be the number one producer of lighter or lower in alcohol wine in the world. We shouldn't forget this industry has been based on a lot of new and innovative technology. That gave this initiative the base knowledge to undertake this challenge. We have a body of very modern technology, both the vineyard and the winery, through being, and I think uh, Junior may mention this, we are a very young industry. And through that, our wineries have some of the most up-to-date technology within them. Uh, a lot of young and vibrant and technically able winemakers and viticulturists. 
And it's with that base understanding we were able to uh, launch this program. Still not easy. Nobody could just dial up the wines that they're trying to achieve. So we embarked on this research program. And the first phase of that was the sensory side. We're the first country in the world that we can see that's taken a lower alcohol wine and, and, and discovered what is the contribution of alcohol when you incrementally add alcohol back. What is the interplay of residual sugar, acid, CO2 and other components to enable the wines to deliver on the goal? And this is through consumer and technical taste panels. We have been able to provide this, the sensory profiling that we need to achieve, to, uh, need to create to achieve our goal. In the vineyard, this is where it all begins, and we've understood the role of harvest timing, site, clone, also how we can manage the canopy, and through judicial leaf removal at critical times, we'll, we can freeze frame the sugar development, and you'll all know sugar converted it through fermentation gives us alcohol. So if we can reduce the sugar levels of the juice arriving at the winery, we have the, a golden opportunity to, to create the lower alcohol wines. By canopy manipulations, we can hold the sugar or reduce the sugar accumulation while still seeing flavor development, acid reduction, and all the other factors associated with grapes maturing without the sugar development. And then, I wish it was just a single bullet or a silver bullet to enable us to achieve this goal, but it's a combination of a range of small components to get us to our end goal. And in the winery, there's a, a, a lot of opportunities to also focus on the factors that influence the finished alcohol in wine. And that's through the fermentation phase, whether it be the oxygen, temperature, yeast selection, and handling of the juice to, with, a, with a focus of producing wines with a lower alcohol. And then blending back various components to enable the wine still to deliver on our goal. And many of you got a chance to try yesterday, and thanks to Tim and his tasting, there was one, and it was a cracker of a lighter wine, the Stonely 2018 Lighter Sauvignon Blanc. It was the second wine in the tasting. And hopefully you all tried that wine yesterday and were suitably impressed, as I was, just the quality and uh, calibre of the wine that's been achieved. And Richard will now continue the discussion on how the consumers have been receiving the wines, and I think it's quite insightful. Thanks, DJ. We've made a lot of great progress. Um, in fact, there's been a tremendous amount of uh, product development, um, and New Zealand's really been our playground. It, New Zealand is a great market. You can try things, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't kill you. Um, so we've learned a lot in this market. Uh, so much so that right now in the category in New Zealand, uh, there's around 50 wines competing in the category. Um, the category has enjoyed a compound annual growth rate over the last four years of 17%. The beer guys get excited with four or five, we're clocking 17. Um, in terms of uh, revenue, uh, the category is currently around about $35 million. And if you want some uh, a benchmark, I think uh, Jonathan yesterday talked about organics doing about $28 million. So low alcohol is already doing 35 in this market. Uh, in terms of uh, volume, if, if uh, lighter in alcohol was a winery in its own right, it would be a category two winery, so around about two and a half million litres. Um, so all up, it's accounting for about 3% of total wine sold. Now for some people that doesn't sound like a lot, but we're not competing in every segment. So the ones that we are, and of course um, the most important one, 6% of all Sauvignon Blanc sold in New Zealand now is lighter in alcohol. So that's significant. It's the same for Pinot Gris or Grigio. And Rosé is uh, around about 8%. And Rosé is really interesting because, like in many markets, it's been on fire. It's been growing around about 40%. And lighter in alcohol Rosé has played a significant role uh, in the development of that category. Um, and the good news from all of these uh, segments is that uh, lighter in alcohol has actually been incremental to full strength wine. So it hasn't been a case of cannibalizing one for the other. We've also, uh, when we enter our wines and wine competitions, there's no special class for lighter in alcohol. We put them in open class and deliberately so uh, because when a consumer buys a lighter in alcohol driven by a moderation occasion, they expected to deliver on their flavour expectations. So this is the, the best test for us, is putting into open class, and we've enjoyed, uh, certainly in recent times, a lot of success. And just a few examples, um, a lighter rosé won the trophy for best rosé in the Melbourne Wine Show. 
uh, one of the Pina Grees from our program picked up a blue gold in Sydney. Um, and in a respect to competition in New Zealand, this wine here, Stonely Lighter, uh, actually won a gold. And it's sister full strength, won a silver. So we love that. And incidentally, I know this wine was tasted yesterday. I think it was second wine in. Uh, there's currently 5,000 SKUs scanning in New Zealand, wine SKUs. And uh, this wine is in the top 100. And uh, some retailers are surprised by that. Uh, so it's got their wine, not, not being purchased once, actually many times. Uh, so we're definitely seeing a lot of repeat purchase. Now in our development, you'll have to excuse the pun, we focus on the low-hanging fruit. So Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Gris, Rosé. As DJ mentioned, our focus is on reducing the alcohol naturally, and to do that for red wine is a lot harder. And uh, we're really excited, uh, thanks to um, John Forrest and um, his team there, uh, with a lot of hard work. Uh, we've had a breakthrough in red with uh, a low alcohol Pinot Noir, 9.5%, and it tastes like great Pinot Noir. Um, our first commercial release of that was last year. Um, uh, Victoria from Booz, I think is here, um, uh, was lucky enough to get some in the UK and it was also sold uh, exclusively to one of the chains here in New Zealand and sold out very quickly. Um, so we're expecting great things and uh, John has certainly been very generous uh, with sharing his IP as part of the programme. So it's been uh, an exciting five years, challenging five years. I think we're making a lot of progress. We feel like we're on the cusp of delivering part of wine's future. And along the way, we've uh, collected a few fans, and I wanted to uh, just finish with a quote from uh, Philip Reedman. Um, Philip uh, was invited to um, oversee our first technical workshop, which was back in 2014. And then three years later, we invited him back to, to, for him to, to actually tell us how we were going. And he was so impressed with the improvement in quality, he's a bit of a, he's a, bit of a fiend on Twitter. So he tweeted afterwards, I cheat a fascinating taste of commercialised experimental lot of wines in Blenheim, and I have glimpsed a part of wine's future. And we certainly think it is a part of wine's future. And I, uh, I'd like to thank you for coming here and getting a glimpse of it for yourselves. And I'd finally like to thank our international retailer guests who very kindly accepted our invitation to come all the way to New Zealand to learn more about the Lighter Wines program. So I'd like to thank uh, Ellie and Anne from Waitrose UK, Vic Victoria from Booth UK, uh, Marie from Sistan Belagat, and Vincent from the LCBO in Canada, and also uh, Nitin and Gary from Endeavour Drinks Group in Australia. Uh, and also, Sharon Nagel, who's from uh, Mondial Sauvignon, Sauvignon, she's my terrible French. Um, she's also been uh, taking a keen interest in the category, and we thank Sharon for coming all the way uh, from, from France. So thank you very much for your time and attention. <laughs>